welcome everybody. Um, I guess uh, we'll, we'll just quickly introduce ourselves here. Uh, Larry, why don't you go ahead and start? Who are you? I am Larry Walters, uh, the owner and operator of Walters Law Group. Our law firm has been around uh, for over 30 years advocating for the rights of the adult entertainment industry. We represent clients throughout the United States and around the world, uh, primarily in issues relating to the First Amendment, internet law, and intellectual property issues. And Corey Silverstein is uh, my up counsel to my firm and uh, happy to be here and help answer some questions. Well, and uh, as Larry said, I'm uh, Corey Silverstein. I operate Silverstein Legal. Uh, I've been in the adult entertainment industry a little bit less than Larry, as you can see from the difference in our skin texture. Um, really happy to be here. I'm actually on, I'm a member of the Pineapple Support Board. Um, and so it's, uh, this is a especially um, important event for me. And uh, I'm very grateful to all of you that are here today. And of course, grateful to all of our sponsors. Uh, Larry and I have uh, created a uh, kind of a, a, an agenda of items that we want to talk about today. Um, if you guys have any questions during the group, uh, you should be able to put them into the, into the chat. Um, I believe, I, I, if maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think you should be able to put messages in there. Um, we'll try to reserve a little bit of time at the end, but because our, you know, our time is limited, we'll do the best we can to uh, answer questions as we go. So um, the purpose of today uh, is to give a lot of you or all of you uh, an update on some of the, uh, you see Kelly message, so I guess we can use the chat. So um, if those of you who want to chat, just click the chat button on the bottom of the Zoom webinar screen and you'll be able to see the, the chat. Um, all right, so uh, one of the areas that obviously uh, is very important that Larry and I felt we wanted to address right away is that a lot of you um, and the great majority of you who are in here today are, are solo content uh, creators. Uh, you um, are entrepreneurs in business uh, for yourselves, operating on multiple different platforms. And a lot of people lately have been asking a lot of questions as to, hey, you know, why is it that we've seen across the board, all the platforms have made so many changes in terms of what documentation they need from you, what information they want from you, what questions they have for you when they sign up. And for even a lot of you that have been on those platforms for a while, you're now having to, um, in essence, quasi re-sign re up by providing additional information. So for uh, a lot of you who, who weren't aware of, of what's going on, MasterCard, the credit card, the credit card acquirer, um, set forth some new uh, rules with um, respect to this particular industry. And uh, a lot of those rules, um, doesn't really matter why they did it, because you know, we, could, we could spend three days or three years speculating and trying to figure out why they did it the way they did. But they've created some rules that have created uh, quite a bit of um, uncertainty in the adult entertainment industry. And it forced um, banks to put pressure on all of the um, platforms across the board to make changes so that they're in compliance. So the, the, the short and easy kind of explanation is that all the platforms had to do this so that they could continue to exist. Because as all of you know, credit cards uh, is still the number one form of payment for uh, people who are buying your content, watching your content, subscribing to your content. And in order for the platforms to continue to accept MasterCard as a payment provider, um, they were obligated to make uh, a lot of these changes. And, and this is where uh, you've now seen all the different platforms putting um, different new requirements, procedures in place. Uh, Larry, maybe you can jump in on that. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it, it's been a difficult road for both the platforms and the performers uh, you know, trying to navigate through some of these new requirements. And you know, part of the problem is that you've got MasterCard that comes out with a list of, of guidelines, uh, some of which are a bit vague or you know, left to interpretation as to what they really mean or how they can be complied with. And then you have the various credit card processors, you know, hundreds of them at least, um, looking at these rules and deciding how they are going to actually implement them and what they're going to require for each individual merchant or platform that they service. And so you know, what we're seeing is some inconsistencies uh, with regard to how the processors are interpreting these rules, telling some platforms, oh, you've got to do this or you've got to do that. 
Uh, and, and this comes up not only with the documents that you have to provide in order to be, let's say, authenticated or to uh, allow third parties to participate in your content, but also with the kind of content that you're now allowed to publish. Uh, some of the, the updated requirements mandate content filters and content moderation procedures by the platforms. And so a lot of them have gone to you know, automation, automated uh, technology filters, uh, artificial intelligence that, that look for certain types of content. And as we know, with, with all filters like that, you know, they get it wrong. Uh, the algorithms are not perfect and they you know, will identify potentially prohibited content in areas where it really isn't. And so we've seen you know, a lot of concerns with over-moderation uh, or content being flagged as potentially prohibited when you know, it really is in full compliance with the rules. So you know, everybody is, is really trying to, to juggle this and figure out how we operate in the new normal with these requirements as they're you know, interpreted by the various different processors. And you know, it can be a, a tremendously frustrating thing for performers who've you know, gotten used to a certain set of documents and procedures and content restrictions to then be you know, thrown into a new world where everybody's trying to figure it out. Um, but you know, you, you're right on, uh, on spot on, Corey, with regard to you know, this is demanded from on high. You know, these aren't the platforms deciding uh, we're going to make life difficult for our performers. They, they want to get along with performers. Obviously, that's the lifeblood of any uh, content sharing platform, but they're being dictated to by the financial services industry. And you know, the reality is to survive as, uh, as a platform and i.e. as a content creator, you've got to comply with the rules as dictated by uh, MasterCard and the banks and the acquirers, some of which can be inconsistent. Yeah. And, it, you know, Larry, it, it's frustrating because every, um, as, as some of you may or may not know, MasterCard actually didn't impose these regulations directly onto the websites. The way MasterCard wrote these regulations is they actually imposed the regulations on the processors or the mids or however you want to refer to them as, and they're actually left to um, interpret these rules very differently. And so what's happening is that a lot of different platforms, because there, there's so many different mids out there and so many different banks that they use, they're getting different directions from the different banks that they utilize. And I, th I think this is one of the big reasons why, Larry, you know, when people are saying, well, why is, you know, one platform doing this and why is one platform doing that? It's quite candidly because they don't all use the same merchant processors. They have different ones and their banks are telling them different things. Yeah, and um, you know, th there's a difference between the processors and the depository banks. You know, we see issues with the actual uh, banks where platforms are depositing money or paying out to creators, imposing their own set of restrictions. Um, you know, aside from what MasterCard is requiring, you know, they'll see issues, they read things in the press, you know, the, the dust up about um, MindGeek and, and Pornhub and you know, Visa MasterCard having issues with them. And they read about that and then they say, well, you know, we got to take a second look at all adult entertainment websites and make sure that they're you know, not going to get us in trouble or harm our reputation as a bank. And so, you know, on top of the processor requirements, the depository institutions are you know, coming to the platforms and saying, we want to see X, Y and Z implemented. We want to know that you're doing A, B and C with regard to the content. And so it's, you know, it's this multi-layered uh, set of requirements and guidelines that the, uh, the platforms are you know, trying to juggle and implement uh, to try to satisfy you know, the, the processors and the banks. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, it, it's a, the other interesting point to make, Larry, is we're unfortunately, we're going to have to wait until we see, you know, MasterCard point the finger at someone and say, OK, you guys did this wrong to actually learn what it is that, you know, they consider to be, you know, outside the scope of, the scope of their new rules. There, there, you know, many people are have read their rules and find them to be quite uh, ambiguous in many ways, and I've read them, and and uh, I tend to agree. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, in the coming months, years, you know, as Mastercard turns to the banks and say, okay, well, we've got a problem with the way that someone's doing that or someone's doing that, and we'll have to see how, um, you know, how that shakes up. Um, now, in turn, with that, Larry, one of the the big issues that we wanted to uh, really talk about is we wanted to talk to people about um, the issues that they're now having with content that they had previously created. So a lot of performers uh, in this industry are, are solo models. 
Um, oftentimes they're, they're solo uh, creators. And, and just so you, know, you guys all know, I, I'm using the words models, creators, producers, all interchangeably. It's just there's, there's so many different categories. So if I, if I flip between the words I'm using, it's all, I'm, I'm meaning all the same group. Um, but a lot of people uh, had been creating content for years, Larry. And, and you know, Larry, you and I have, have spoken together in panels across the world. And we've implored content producers to make sure that they have their paperwork in place because something like this could ultimately happen. And so now there's a lot of performers who are saying, hey, you know, what do I do? Because I have all this content. And quite honestly, I don't have all of the paperwork that uh, the different platforms are asking for. So, you know, what do I do? Where do I go? And, and we're seeing so much of that now, Larry, that I, I think this is a you know an excellent segue to, to talk to this group and potentially um, give them a little information about you know where where they are now. Yeah, Corey, that's that's an excellent point. I mean, the uh, you know, the requirements associated with adult entertainment content are, are pretty specific. Um, you know, obviously you have to have model releases and 2257 information, and you know, we, we've been kind of preaching that for a long time. Um, but as the, re the responsibility for creating content has shifted from professional uh, studios to content creators themselves, you know, all of those procedures that were in place by the studios didn't necessarily transfer. And then you've got a lot of new folks coming into the industry with no history of ever having worked for a professional studio trying to figure all this out on their own. And it, it can be difficult, it can be intimidating, um, but you know, the, these requirements that are being imposed by the banks reinforce the need for making sure that you have all of your content supported by the required documents because at, at any time you could be asked for it as we're seeing now. And if you don't have it, if it was the subject of a handshake deal or content trade with no documents, uh, you know, one or both of the parties are gonna have a problem with continuing to monetize that content because you know, most importantly, the banks and the processors want to know that the content was created consensually. You know, they're very concerned about revenge porn, obviously concerned about underage, not as big of a problem in the adult entertainment industry, but you know, consent is an issue. And you know, there, there has been incidences of content being used without permission of one of the other parties or used on a platform where the other party didn't anticipate it was going to be used or in some way. And so there's, you know, we've seen a lot of disputes over consent, not only to recording the content, but to its distribution and publication on platforms. So you know, that's what the, the processors and the banks want to know. Is this content, you know, subject to some kind of written document where we can see that it was authorized to be recorded and published? Um, the, the disconnect, though, that what we're seeing, the problem is that, you know, in particular with MasterCard, they don't really understand how the adult entertainment industry works and they don't really understand you know the concept of model releases and, and the types of legal language that have been used and so we've seen instances where you know people will have a model release and a 2257 form from a few years ago and they'll use that to you know support the content and you know one or more platform or you know, a bank or a processor will say no we want to see a document a consent form that says that the content can be published on this particular platform you're not going to find that in any model release. You're not going to see model release that lists, you know, 17 different platforms specifically by name where the content can be published. But that's, you know, in, in MasterCard's head, apparently what they were looking for in terms of, you know, specificity of um, making sure that the content is consensual and that it can be published on a particular platform. So we're seeing, you know, a bit of a learning curve uh, by MasterCard and, you know, how the adult industry works. And hopefully those issues will be ironed out and, you know, the typical model releases in 2257 paperwork will be acceptable uh, as these you know, issues get discussed with processors and banks. Yeah. And I, you know, Larry, one of the things that you, you kind of just brought up that I, I think is important to bring up also is the massive quantity of, let's call it bad free forms that are out there floating around. And, you know, one of the things that that's come out of this is, is like you said a minute ago, Larry, where you were talking about, you know, specific paperwork that people are looking for. And for a very long time, a lot of people uh, in the industry have relied on these, these, I've seen them, they're these free forms that are floating around that people either, you know, they find them partially on, on Google or they, or they mash them together from a bunch of different other forms that they've, that they've found. And this has now led to um, 
quite a, you know, a mess for a lot of content producers because quite frankly, their forms don't hold legal water. And so what I've been encouraging, and, and I think one of the things that, that we certainly encourage all of you content producers out there to do immediately, don't wait on this because every day that you make another video or film or clip or still photography, whatever it is you're making, that you're relying and making that with a certain set of, of documents that may or may not actually hold the legal weight that you really need to, you might be creating content that is quite frankly going to be worthless because you're not going to be able to sell it anywhere. And so we've been encouraging you to, you know, reach out. It, you know, I, I certainly, uh, I've made it a point over 17 years. I don't, I don't come on these seminars for self-promotion. And so I would say, you know, there are plenty of good lawyers out there. Uh, Larry and I are one of them, but, but please, I mean, talk to your own lawyer, talk to, you know, a lawyer who has experience in this particular industry and can look over the documents you're using and make sure that those documents you're using are going to be okay. Because, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. I mean, Larry, I get, I get these calls every day now, every single day, I get an email or a phone call from content producers who are like, Hey, you know, Corey, my documents just got rejected. Can you look at this? And then I look at it and, and immediately, you know, my, my, I, I slap my hand to my, my head. Cause I'm saying, where on earth did you get that from? Did you, did you ever, have it reviewed or, or have, it con have it considered. And I think now more than ever, Larry, the importance of having that documentation. And when I say the documentation, I mean correct documentation that's gonna be enforceable at the time of creation of the content is it's saying it's important is no longer, that's not a strong enough word. It is a necessity, I think would be the appropriate word. Yeah, I mean, how many times have we seen, you know, for example, the, uh combined 2257 model release where you know all the 2257 information is in the middle of a model release where you know the regulations say you're supposed to keep your 2257 documents separate from your model releases and if yep. there is ever an inspection you know do you want the government looking through all your financial paperwork and and model releases in order to be able to show them the 2257 forms but you know for whatever reason we've seen a lot of these forms out there just kind of mix and mash them together um, presumably for efficiency or just people not knowing what they're doing um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of common mistakes that um, are made, you know, with possibly good intentions or, again, for efficiency purposes, but can have real ramifications if they're not done correctly in, in the first instance. So, you know, getting that, uh, that paperwork at the time, like you mentioned, Corey, of production is critical because it can be very difficult, you know, to track somebody down years later, or I need you to sign a new form, and you try to backdate it, or I need, you know, missing pieces of information from my 2257 records. Uh, it can be almost impossible to find some of these people or to get them to sign new documents. We've got a couple comments and one question that came in. I, I guess I want to address Caitlin's question first, because Caitlin, you ask an incredible question that Larry and I get on a daily basis. And you say, is there a standard form that's available? And that is the word that terrifies us. Because unfortunately, there isn't a standard form because your, your document is going to dr differ dramatically depending on First of all, what kind of content you're creating? On what basis are you doing it? Are you paying the other model? Are you trading it? Are you doing it on, on you know, what sort of license rights you're giving, et cetera? Then of course you run into the problem where the laws of, we'll just, we'll just talk about the US for, for right now, but you have 50 different states in this country with 50 different sets of laws. And so when you start playing around with forms, and you start saying, you know, is there a standard form? You really can't because that form might not hold water in one state from another. And so, and that's one of the biggest issues that I see where I see people using this form. So I, I Caitlin, your question is, is fantastic. And the answer is no, there's not a standard form. And I would urge you to be very careful with people out there that are saying that they have one or they give you one that works. Um, there's a reason, you know, there, there's, there's a reason why attorneys exist. I, you know, I'm, I'm sure we can make a thousand different lawyer jokes, but this is one of them. And this is one of those times where it's like, I strongly urge you to make sure that you're, you know what you're doing. Um, Todd, right before that, uh, forgive me, Todd, I can't, I, I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name because if I butcher it, I don't want to insult you. Um, but Todd, you, you made a, you made a point. You said that one of the problems you've seen is that different sites are accepting different ID cards and you obviously have security concerns. And and Todd, I think that is an excellent point. And one of the things that I've been advising all my clients to do is make sure 
that when you are picking the platform that you're going to work with, that they're reputable. Make sure that you're going online and you're talking to other people about the platform and that you're not just signing up and providing your info to maybe a platform that just pops up overnight. And we see that every day where a, a, you know, a new platform pops up, they come out of nowhere and you're supplying all sorts of data to them and you really don't know what's going on. So I would urge you, Todd, that you know it's an excellent point that you made and I would urge everyone who's here to make sure that you're doing your homework, make sure that you're picking your platforms, go out, ask questions about their reputation, ask questions from other people who are in the industry that, you know, the beauty of, of organizations like, like, you know, Pineapple Support and all the different organizations and Twitter groups and so forth is that there's always people out there you can talk to and ask. And look, if you talk to four people and four people tell you they've never heard of that platform, I would urge you some caution before you send over your sensitive data. Um, and so you, you should very much be um, keeping that in mind. Um, Larry, did you want to add to that? Only that, you know, on the issue of new platforms popping up and we're seeing a lot of that um, because of the popularity of the, you know, the OnlyFans type business model. And yep. um, a lot of them don't have legal advice or are, you know, using what other platforms are doing or what the, the new platform thinks some other platform is doing in terms of, you know, backend procedures and trying to figure this out as they go. So, you know, they may be making um, decisions that are very different than what other platforms are doing or that other decisions that are not required by the law or by the MasterCard guidelines um, just because they're new and they're trying to figure it out. So if you're seeing you now that kind of inconsistency uh, by the new platforms, it's you know, largely because they don't have the experience of the established platforms and you know, they, they haven't run into all these issues and had all the conversations and negotiations with the processors and the banks and MasterCard to understand what they need to be doing. Yeah. You know, there's been, um, Larry, kind of speaking of, of content rights and consent and stuff, there's obviously been, we've seen, uh, a lot of us have seen the headlines recently, there's been some new developments in um, the ongoing saga of, uh, of Girls Do Porn. Um, obviously now um, we've had at least, I believe, two criminal convictions, multiple guilty pleas. We have, uh, we've seen people that are now incarcerated. There's uh, obviously a massive civil judgment floating out. And most recently, Larry, uh, there's now a, uh, a judge that has uh, granted copyrights to um, the performers, which is uh, something we don't, we, we don't see that too often, do we, Larry? This is kind of a little bit of a kind of a, a, a newsworthy event. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a copyright granted in the course of a, a criminal restitution. Um, you know, certainly federal judges have uh, virtually unlimited power and, you know, they can do whatever the, they put in an order. Um, and, you know, your remedy is to appeal it if you don't like it. But, um, you know, obviously the judge was, was trying to make things right, saw some abusive behavior um, by the defendants and um, try to figure out, you know, what can we do for these victims who have had, you know, content put out there that was created as a result of force or fraud or coercion, and it's all over the place. Um, you know, the, the easiest remedy for that is to allow the performers to get that taken down on their own, you know, to find it and be able to ask the platform to take it down. Well, they can't do that unless they're the copyright holder. And right. technically they weren't the copyright holder because you know, girls do porn producers produce the content and they own the copyright. So um, it was a, you know, it was a novel approach to trying to remedy a wrong. Um, but the good news is for, you know, these 400 plus performers um, that have been victimized or the court found to be victimized by these producers, they can now go out there and, you know, find this content, hire DMCA services uh, to get the content taken down and not continue to be re-victimized by the continued presence of the content online. Yeah, it, it, it really intrigues me, Larry, because it opens up the door and it really opens up the door for various options that these, you know, uh, these victims, because I think we can safely call them victims at, at this point, they now have, they can, um, you know, they themselves can obviously be going the DMCA takedown route. They can even with, having the US copyrights, they can initiate federal litigation in the US if they, you know, that's the direction they want to go. And um, 
I think in the, you know, the coming months and time, it's going to be very interesting uh, to keep an eye on this and see, you know, how, uh, you know, these victims are, are react, because like you said, Larry, and, and I think you make an excellent point, the content's all over the place. And um, it's extremely, you know, difficult to take down when you have, you know, just websites based in you know, 50 different countries and different platforms behind walls and with file lockers and the list goes on and on and on. But it definitely, it puts a little bit more control and it gives these victims a nice tool to be able to, um, you know, combat this. So it's, and, it, and it's interesting, Larry, that you mentioned that, that, you know, it's the criminal court that did it because I, I, now that I'm even thinking about it, I don't know if I can remember any other case where a criminal proceeding resulted in that. I can't think of one. And, and uh, like, you know, like we started with, you're a little older than me. So maybe, maybe you've got a couple, couple more in, in the memory bank, but I, I can't think of a single one. No, uh, you know, restitution rights are, are fairly broad and you know, the judges can craft an appropriate remedy uh, based on you know, what, what happened to the victim. And in this case, I mean, it's uh, it's smart. It's it's unique. I don't know. If it could be challenged on appeal, perhaps, if anybody really wanted to to fight that. Um, but you know, it's it's doubtful that that they will. Um, as of now, at least, the performers do have a remedy. Can go after the you know, producer. I mean, the the distributors of this content and get it taken down and you know prevent the revictimization. Uh, so you know, it, I think that the industry has also learned a few things from that prosecution in terms of best practices. Mm -hmm. um, to ensure you know safety of performers on set, um, consent, uh, clear disclosure of everything that's going to happen during a production, so that you know there's no surprises. People aren't being lured or duped into doing things that they don't want to do. Um, making sure that everybody gets paid, you know, what they were promised to be paid. But I think there's been some real good lessons that have been taken away from uh, from the prosecution and some um, you know important industry standards. Have developed as a result of seeing, you know, what can go wrong and the devastation that it can cause, um, you know, both for the, uh, the performers who, who've been victimized and, you know, for anybody who is engaging in those activities. Yeah. Going back real quick to the the previous discussion, uh, we have we had another comment, Larry, regarding the different forms of IDs the platforms are 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 seeking, and I think that. Um, Todd, just to, to kind of jump on your, your point, because I think you, you make an interesting and good point. It's important to, to remember, and this is just my experience, that the reputable platforms and um, providers, um, they have large teams of people and compliance people. You mean now more than ever, their compliance, the size of their compliance teams have tripled, quadrupled. Um, I would actually encur encourage content creators to message them, send them emails. A lot of them have, you know, designated uh, people that you can reach out to, to ask specific questions, ask them, you know, what is going to be, you know, what is going to be acceptable? What's not, what are you looking for? Um, sometimes I, I'm not going to say that every website has, you know, clear uh, terms. Oftentimes it can, it can be a little tricky to navigate through. And so I would ask, I, I would always encourage any uh, person using any platform to reach out to those platforms and ask them, ask them. And, you know, what do you suggest? What do you, you know, not if for some reason they, they reject something, ask them why, you know, get clarity on why it is that they rejected your ID or your consent form and, and so forth. I think that, you know, these platforms, um, they want to talk to you. They want you to be on their platform. So they're going to, they're going to do everything they can to try to, to help you get through the compliance process. So I, I think it's important to do that. Now, speaking, speaking of Larry, one of the things I guess that, that, you know, should be discussed that oftentimes isn't is okay. So when we're talking about, you know, a performer creating content you know, what are the actual documents? You know, what are the, I, I, again, we're not going to use the word standard form because I hate that. I hate that. I think that's a dangerous term. But what are the legal documents that they should absolutely be putting together at every single shoot? Yeah, well, um, you know, it's, it's one of those lawyer answers where uh, it depends. Um, yeah. There are some, some minimally required documents. Everybody's familiar with the model release. Uh, but the terms of the model release can vary dramatically depending on you know, what rights you're giving away, whether it's a content trade, whether you're offering 
uh, a limited license, an exclusive versus non-exclusive license, whether you're giving up all copyright ownership. Um, there can be you know, a, a lot of different ways to part with rights to your content and to um, include those terms in a release. Um, obviously, a, a 2257 form uh, that acquires all the, the necessary information required by the federal statute, uh, IDs, you know, copies of, of valid IDs, and you know, the, the type of ID that is acceptable depends on where the content is being produced. So and those are, are legal issues that need to be looked at. Um, if you have a photographer involved, you know, you're going to want to make sure that you have a, a work for hire photographer agreement in place so that the photographer doesn't end up owning all the copyrights because that by default is what happens under copyright law. Uh, whoever creates the content, whoever's behind the camera is presumed to own the content. Uh, in, in the absence of a, a legal document you know, otherwise. So, you know, that photographer agreement, if you have a separate photographer involved, uh, is important. So you can make sure that whoever is the intended owner of the copyrights to the content actually gets those rights. Um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of other, I, I wouldn't say documentation, but procedures that you know, really should be implemented in any content production. You know, we've talked about this at length at, at other uh, panels, so you know, I won't go too deep into it, but you know, the, the end goal is to make sure that there is full disclosure to the performers of what's going to happen, make sure all the performers understand what they're signing, the nature of the rights that they're giving up, um, the fact that the content is going to be you know, readily available online, if that's the intended use, um, that it involves you know, adult entertainment, uh, should be obvious from the documents as well, but get that confirmation and make sure everybody is, is lucid, not under the influence of drugs or alcohol, um, speaks the, the the native language that the model release is in, and things like that to ensure that people are they know what they're doing and they know what they're getting into. And uh, after the production is done, you know, we typically recommend a, another sit down, uh, usually on on video, where the, the performers ask a series of questions about, you know, was everything okay? Um, did, did you get paid? Were there any surprises? Anything go wrong? Are you happy? You know, with how you were treated? To make sure that if there are any issues, if somebody is going to walk out and say. Wow, well, that wasn't what I expected, or they treated me wrong. Let's air that out right now. If there's going to be a problem with the the produced content, you need to know sooner rather than later. You know, after you post produce it and get it online and start monetizing it, and then somebody complains about it, um, that's the wrong time to learn there was a problem. So, you know, those are just some some basics that that should be followed. And you know, Larry, there's no question also that what happens is, oftentimes we see situations where. Uh, content is created and someone is in the content who at the time of creating the content, actually, they are perfectly fine with it. They want to create the content. It's fully consensual. They're fully uh, lucid. Um, but then some time passes and and five, six years down the road, something happens. They they find a spouse. They find religion. They, you know, who knows what something something dramatically changes in their life. And all of a sudden they decide that, OK, I regret doing that and I want it down. And so what we see so often is, you know, the first thing that oftentimes people will say is, oh, it, it wasn't really consensual or, um, you know, something was wrong with the documentation or I never got this copy or that copy. And this is one of the reasons why I implore my content creator um, clients and, and everyone who, who's attending today and, and, and listening and taking part of this seminar, I implore you all, make sure that you guys are hanging on to these records. These records you should be treating as no different than you would a solid brick of gold. Because if somebody in the future decides to make some allegation against you, and ultimately it's not true, you are going to want to have this stuff to be able to protect yourself. And, and it happens, all of you. It, it absolutely 110% happens. We see it all the time. Um, and, and, you know, like I said, and sometimes it's years down the road. You know, you, you don't hear from a performer for two years or three years and you're like, okay, great. You know, who cares? I can, you know, I can throw out my box that says records from 2018. But, you know, because you want to save some space or whatever. I, I cannot strongly urge you enough to not engage in those sorts of practices. These records are absolutely essential and, and you never know what's going to come up in the future. You know, in, in, the, in the mainstream movie business, Larry, oftentimes uh, the big 
movie companies, the Paramounts of the world and stuff, they, they have something available to them that the adult entertainment industry doesn't. And they have insurance policies that they're able to procure, which will protect them from a lot of, you know, problems. And, in, but unfortunately in this particular industry, in our industry, those sorts of insurances don't really exist. And so that leaves it to the content creators to be in a position where you have got to create your own form of insurance and creating your own form of insurance is not just, you know, a one day process. It is an ongoing obligation. It's an ongoing process that you have to have as long as you're in this particular industry and, and, and uh, producing or publishing the content. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's not only the physical records, but you know, other evidence of the production, if, if you're filming the execution of the documents or filming questions being asked to the performer to ensure that, you know, again, they're, they're lucid, they're consenting, uh, any follow-up interviews, that all should be kept, you know, in, in some format with the, with the documents. Todd's, co Todd's comment uh, about making copies of everything, yes, absolutely, don't rely on, you know, one record, one file storage system uh, because you know things can be lost, things can crash. Uh, keeping the, a paper copy even after you scan it into your file locker, that's a good idea in case you lose the electronic copy. Um, redundancy, just like hosting uh, for the hosts out there, you know, make sure that you have access to these records because to the extent that you know there is a problem, and, and we've seen it come up ten years after the content is is produced because you know the material is still out there and could still be you know, a source of concern to people who are depicted in it. And um, so it, it really is the kind of documentation and, and records that can't be destroyed. It's kind of like you know, uh, essential tax records. Just, just keep them forever, as long as you're in the business and probably a good five, 10 years after that, in case something arises. You know, and that's phenomenal. You know, it, that's spot on advice, uh, Larry. So one of the other things that, that I that I wanted uh, us to cover today, um, obviously Pineapple Support was created as an organization committed to the mental health of people in the adult entertainment industry. Um, Pineapple Support has done a absolutely incredible job and has been working tirelessly to get um, people uh, the emotional, psychological support that, that a lot of them may very much need. Something that's come up, Larry, and something that, that I thought would be good to talk about is instances of what to potentially do uh, when you see someone else, someone that you work with in the industry who might be in trouble. And they, you know, now the question comes up is like, well, you know, am I legally responsible? Do I, do I legally have to do something because I see someone might be in, you know, having a, a mental crisis or a psychological uh, issue. And so we get that question a lot. And, and I think it'd be worth, you know, we're actually incredibly time is flying by here. So I, I wanted to, I want to leave a couple minutes at the end for questions, but I, but I wanted to at least quickly touch upon this subject in terms of, you know, should people be considering, you know, legal risk if they potentially see someone who's struggling? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent question. And, you know, we're, we, we see it uh, more and more in terms of you know, people having issues uh, either with their um, content production or outside the industry. Uh, you know, the bottom line is that the specific answer to the question will depend on the state law of wherever the incident is occurring. You know, some states have interpreted their, you know, their, their duty to assist laws or negligence laws to include a, a duty to help somebody if they're in Know, some kind of obvious distress, uh, but not everywhere. So you know, it's, it is a matter of looking at where you're at, but just from a, a humanitarian and moral standpoint, you know, it's important to help your, your fellow people uh, that you're in this business with. And if, if you see somebody who is in distress, you know, the legal issues aside, uh, try to help them, uh, ask if they need help. You know, a simple you know, inquiry or question can often lead to somebody you know, opening up a little bit. And so it's, it's essential that, uh, that you, you take you approach this not necessarily from a legal standpoint, but you know, from a humanitarian standpoint. Yeah, it, and I guess it's not just uh, you said state, but you know, I, I guess we should mention that you know some people who are here today are actually you know here from different countries, yeah. and so it's not just potentially applicable to the U.S. It's also applicable to Canada, or excuse, just to Canada to the rest of the world. Excuse me. Not sure why I said Canada. I meant the rest of the world. Um, all right, so. 
Uh, we have a little bit of time remaining and what we wanted to do is we wanted to, to save this time for any uh, questions or specific um, topics or discussion points that anyone here would like us to, to talk about. So this is where for you know those of you that have been patiently uh, reserving your questions, please type them in and uh, we will try to answer them. You don't have to do a hand raise or anything like that. You can just type it in and in the um, in the meantime, and by the way, Todd, uh, your last comment, I, I missed Todd's last comment until I just looked down and saw it uh, with regard to making copies and making backups of your documents. 1000% correct, because you never know if you're keeping it digitally when a hard drive is going to fail. And you never know if you're, you know, living in, in southern New Orleans when another, you know, storm might hit and you have a massive flood. So, um, very, very, very uh, good point, Todd. Very, very thing. And, and I'd also mention, you know, for those of you that are struggling with 2257 record keeping, Larry won't do it himself because it's, it's his product, but Larry actually did create a, a real nifty app. It's called Quick, to, Quick 2257. And uh, I think it costs a whopping 99 cents, I believe. Um, and uh, it's a real nifty app that, that helps you with being able to easily uh, create 2257 records, especially if you're, um, you know, a smaller uh, content creator. So uh, you guys might want to check that out. Now, the good thing about 2257 is, it's, uh, unlike contracts, it's a uh, very specific statutory obligation and it's a federal law. So it's not state by state. Everybody has to live by it. So, you know, that's, that's one legal compliance obligation that can be addressed by an app or a form. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to use. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, it, I, I saw there was a, um, a question, sorry, in the, uh, in the chat about um, if you need to have these documents, if you're the only one in the video. And, mm. uh, you know, it's, a, it's an excellent question and it comes up every once in a while. And, you know, the simple answer is yes. Um, 2257 applies if you're you know, producing this content for commercial purposes. So you have to have a form um, that has all the information about you as a person. Um, you know, a, a model release, if, if, you know, if you are the only one in the video, you don't necessarily have to release it to somebody else, um, but you are going to potentially be asked by platforms for supporting documentation. Um, so you know, a simple document that says that you agree to the publication of this content that you give yourself the rights to, to produce it or distribute it. Um, if you have an LLC or a company, the rights should be going to that company. Um, so yes, it is important to have documentation even if you're the only one in the video. Um, Todd just uh, put in a comment to the group that I actually wanna read because I actually I, I find it amazing. And, and Todd said, I always tell the adult performers, I know how much I love them as a person, how much they're valued as a person and not viewed as a sex object. Mental health is so needed now with everything that's going on. Tell everyone they matter to us and be a friend and listen to people if you care. Todd, that is such an amazing point because, you know, we have so many people in this industry that in many ways have been isolated now for the past two years on top of, you know, having to deal with the, um, you know, the negativity that people often associate with, with sex work. And Todd, you're, you're spot on. It, you know, you absolutely need to make sure that, that you know, people in this industry all understand that we are all in this together. Um, even Larry and I as attorneys, um, you know, it's, we are in this together. And um, it's so important that, that, that people be reminded that, that this is a community where people are there for each other and um, they're there to support each other and they truly care about each other. So, so Todd, I, I, I truly value that, uh, that point you made in there. Um, Larry, you're being asked to talk louder. Okay, I can do that. I need to close <laughs> Kat, my mic. Katarina is, is disappointed with your with your low voice. <laughs> um, Problem. Caitlin, you asked a, a a good question. There are the forms provided on platforms um, legally viable. That's an interesting question. And my suggestion to you there is that you take those forms before you use them. And you bring them to your legal advisor, have your legal advisor look at them. I can't tell you whether every single one is because I haven't seen them all. I know there's a lot of platforms that are giving examples and suggestions out. Um, but I, again, I have to urge extreme caution with those because, again, all of you content producers are in 
50 different states, you're in numerous different countries, the laws are different from state to state and different from country to country. A performer release that is given out on a website, maybe it'll work in one particular state, but maybe it won't in another. I find it highly improbable that one particular form would work across the board. So I would, again, I, I cannot urge you enough to be cautious before using those forms. Um, uh, on, on that point, the, the platforms are trying to comply with a specific obligation that is given to them by you know, MasterCard and their processors. They, they want to see that the people depicted in the content have consented to the recording and the publication of the content on the platform. That is different than a model release. Okay, That, that consent form is, is just to protect the platform to make sure that they're not going to get in trouble for publishing this. A model release will determine who gets what rights, whether they're permanent, whether they're exclusive, non-exclusive, what law applies in determining any disputes, whether you have to go to arbitration, how much you're going to get paid. It's a different document. Um, so, you know, I, I've seen some of the forms that have been circulating. A lot of them are really focused on that consent issue and to publication on the platform, but not the underlying transfer of rights. So you may very well need a model release in addition to whatever consent form you're finding from the platforms. So that's the danger there, Larry. I mean, the danger is of potentially relying on a form that someone might think covers the whole picture, but it doesn't. It only might cover a certain part of it. Exactly right. Yeah. So we got to be. So everyone's got to be real careful with that before they uh, before they uh, use that. Um, and again, guys, I, I I would always encourage you. You know, when you're when you're choosing an attorney or a legal advisor in this business space, make sure you're picking someone that has actual uh, legal experience in this space. Um, unfortunately, uh, over the last few years, there's been a lot of pop-up people who show up one day and say, "Yeah, I'm an adult entertainment lawyer, and I can help you with this, that, or the other." but they truly have no experience in this business whatsoever. And um, they actually can be quite frankly dangerous. So I would encourage you to make sure that you're looking over qualifications. One thing that I always recommend people do is there's a uh, organization, it's called the First Amendment Lawyers uh, Association. Uh, acronym is FALA, F-A-L-A. -A. Take a look, make sure that uh, one of the things you wanna check is to make sure that the lawyer you're, you're uh, talking to is a member of that organization. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that they 100% uh, you know, will know all the adult entertainment stuff, but it's, it's definitely a good start. Yeah, um, there's different specialties, obviously, in adult entertainment itself. Um, some attorneys will focus on you know, representing performers. Some will focus on representing you know, platform operators. Some, some do both. Some are intellectually, intellectual property based. Some are transactional based. Some do litigation. So you know, it's, it's good to ask any potential candidate for legal representation you know, what do they typically do? What is their focus even within the area of adult entertainment? So you're getting, you know, the type of lawyer that you need. And so Lana, your question that goes perfectly along with what Larry just said, it's almost like you two are reading each other's minds. I did um, see the question. Oh, you did see the question. Okay. So, so it's, it's uh, you know, that's exactly Larry's spot on, but, but ultimately, you know, ask, the lawyer, you know, whether they have experience in this, make sure that you make sure that you're asking the person, like, is this something that, that you've done before? Is this something, you know, that you have experience with? If they tell you, no, I've never done it before, you know, then obviously your, your guard should go up and your radar should start spinning and say, okay, this might not be the right, you know, the right legal professional for me. Um, okay. Do we have any other questions? Nothing. All right. Oh, wait, we got one more. We have a compliment, and that's very kind of you. Um, what do you think is the most cost-effective way to store 2257 records? <laughs> that is a phenomenal question, Jeff. And okay, so I'm going to briefly touch on, on two things. Number one, um, some people um, try to utilize what's known as third-party record keepers, which is basically someone else holds on to your 2257 records for you. I am not a fan of that process. I don't recommend it. Um, I know it's legally permissible, but I actually consider it to be a very dangerous, um, I actually consider it to be an extremely dangerous uh, thing you could be doing. The reason why is because you have to remember that 18 USC 2257 falls under the United States Criminal Code. It has substantial criminal penalties associated with it. 
do you really want to put your freedom into the hands of someone else? So I'm not a big, uh, not a big fan of that. But in terms of, you know, storing it, you know, what I would tell you would be a good course of action, Jeff, is you might want to talk to a legal expert about what your specific situation is in terms of where you are, what your situation is, because there are different things. And I do have different um, things that I've recommended to clients before that if you want to uh, protect the privacy of your residents, that you can do it by, you know, using various different means. And um, I would encourage you to to talk out your specific situation with a legal representative and someone who's familiar with the 2257 uh, requirements. Um, because I, because I, I, because I think it's an excellent question. I think it's definitely something you should consider because obviously your security, your privacy should always be number one. I'll, absolutely always. Um, so that being said, I'm, I'm being, uh, people are pointing at me, telling me that, Hello. that I, I knew that I knew that was coming. So uh, we, we are out of time. <laughs> I just want to say, guys, I really appreciate you coming on board. There's so many loop loopholes in this industry. And obviously I'm based in the UK. So I see another side of it as well. Um, but there's so many things that people just aren't aware are out there. And the, 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 the validity of needing to have someone who actually knows what they're talking about is, is way beyond anything that you, you have to invest in good legal representation. You have to have someone that knows and understands the documents that you're signing. If you don't do that, you're just hanging your ass out in the liner really, aren't you? So <laughs> I can't stress enough, get in contact with these guys and let, ask them any questions they put the details in the chat so if you want to refer to them afterwards do so and guys thank you so much again for your time much appreciated and you can see from the comments that everyone really has enjoyed it so i love you and leave you now thank you so much and have a great evening okay Take care, Take care. bye bye guys thanks for Bye. Attending. Be safe. Bye.